Hello and welcome to your 100 most popular cars as voted for by you, the men and motors viewers in your tens of thousands. During the course of all our programmes, we're speaking to a lot of motoring experts, to celebrities offering us their very humble opinions, and most importantly, to you at home. Back in 1990, coupes were cool again, the fashionable choice being either the Volkswagen Corrado or the Vauxhall Calibra. But those who saw past the chic European badges and wanted to mark themselves as something of a driver, went out and bought a Nissan 200SX. Any car that has a turbocharged 200 brake horsepower engine should come with a handle with care label, I think. And I mean, especially the Nissan, because it came from an age before traction control. Launched back in 1989 as a curvy sports coupe, the turbocharged four-cylinder engine will propel the 200SX from 0 to 60 in under seven seconds and to a top speed of 146. Acceleration when it's moving is, is pretty quick. Um, getting it off the line with 295 brake at the wheels is a bit of an issue, um, especially in first gear. But other than that, it's traction all the way. The last 200 SXs were sold in the UK in 2001, after more than a million had been produced. Finding a car that handles really well, that's affordable and easy to maintain, um, is really important. And I mean, the Nissan is just spot on for a track day car because of its fantastic handling and its affordable second-hand value. While most other early 90s coupes have fallen out of fashion, the Nissan 200SX remains a popular fun drive and certainly deserves its place in your chart. Now next, at number 59, it's the Ferrari F40. Launched to celebrate 40 years of Ferrari, the F40 was intended to be the ultimate road car, and it was. The body was made of ultralight Kevlar and carbon fibre reinforced plastic. Basically, a Formula One car with some body panels added. Performance was astronomical. 0 to 60 flew by in 3.5 seconds, and the Brave could go up to 200 miles an hour. It was a car that, you know, stormed around Le Mans and the GT circuits around the world. So, boys of the 80s who were being taught that excess was good and fastest and biggest and loudest was best, then the F40 was the epitome of that. And that's part of the reason for the lasting appeal of the F40. It was the seminal race car for the road, engineered like no road car before it. The chassis was so well designed and engineered, the power had to be kept to a reserved 478 brake horsepower so as to be usable on the road. The chassis was actually capable of handling 600 to 650. The F40 was... Um... I don't know, it was just excess all areas. Ask any child, car enthusiast or racing driver to name their favourite supercar of all time and the F40 will undoubtedly be near the top of the list. And that's why, in our list, it's at number 59. The replacement in the UK for the Ford Sierra was the Ford Mondeo, designed to be Ford's first ever world car. For the motor industry, that is the holy grail. Well, the Ford Mondeo was born of a time when Ford wanted to sell cars in well, all European countries. So they had to produce something that wasn't overtly British. They wanted something that would sell in Germany, sell in France, sell in Italy, sell in Spain. And the Ford Mondeo had to be a car that didn't seem too English, too kind of old-fashioned and old-school. So it's a fairly neutral design. If you think the Sierra was the first the kind of jelly mould shape, the Mondeo softened that down a little bit. And it was actually quite a quite a neutrally styled car because it didn't want to offend anybody. That was basically the logic behind it. I think it's a, it's a classic company car. In terms of anybody who actually goes out and chooses one for themselves, I suspect it's, uh, like me, somebody who just wants a bit of crumple zone and a bit of comfort. I mean, I can, uh, I can drive over sleeping policemen and not, not feel them. The Mondeo first saw public roads in March 1993, available in four-door saloon, five-door hatchback, and five-door estate versions. Safety and security had been vastly uprated from the days of the Sierra, and there was even a new four-cylinder petrol engine available in 1.6, 1.8, and two-litre versions. If you were to think about the level of refinement that back then you would have got for 50,000 pounds, you would have had a BMW, the, the silky smooth, you wouldn't hear no wind noise rattling past the windows, you'd have air conditioning, airbags, you'd have a nice 
five or six stereo system, six speaker stereo system, then all of a sudden we've got a car that comes along that costs between twelve and fifteen thousand pounds, a Ford Mondeo. It's got the airbags, it's dead silent on the road, it's super smooth, it's got a V6 engine in some derivatives, and it only costs a fraction of the cost of a, a much more superior car. The ST220 provided a sporty option for a car who wanted the practicality of a Ford family car along with the power and sporty suspension for maybe when the family wasn't with you. Super powerful Monday ST200. 200 brake horsepower, 0 to 60 watts, 7.8 seconds, 141 miles an hour. Yeah, reasonably quick, but the most important thing was it added glamour to the range. Everybody driving around a 1.8 or 2 litre felt part of this club where there was actually a hot version. Then in 2001, Mondeo changed again into a much more contemporary suit of clothes. The Mark III car added even more ammunition to its armory to keep it at the top of the family car and fleet sales chart. The next car at 57 is a British icon, designed and engineered by a Turk, Alec Isagonis. The Morris Minor offered a range of technical innovations at a budget price. But when William Morris saw his Morris Minor for the first time, he was absolutely furious. He called it a poached egg. And who calls it the Morris Minor? It's the Moggy Minor. You know, everyone's got a massive affection for that car. I think so many people had them or drove them. Everyone's got a story about one in their family or maybe their parents went courting in a Morris Minor. They're not too overpriced and it just there's plenty of nice people who own them that you bump into and everybody you bump into says, I used to have one of those or I learned to drive in one, which is uh, always brings a smile to your face. Released in 1948, the Miner established a reputation in the family saloon sector as a big car. This was due to its four square stance and unusually wide front track. Isagonis actually decided that there wasn't enough room in the cabin, so he cut the Morris Miner in half, had a six inch strip put down the middle and it was slightly wider. I mean, as of, after that, the design didn't change too much. You had pickup versions, you had traveller versions, and the lights moved higher with the bodies for better lighting. That was about it. Under the bonnet is a 948cc engine, and with 0 to 60 in a little over half a minute, this car wasn't exactly going to set the world alight with its speed. But don't forget, this was a family car. My family have got a little bit fed up with them over the years, but they sort of realise how interested I am in the cars, and friends of mine, um, they've sort of come to like the car and they've sort of grown to like it. But despite not being popular with William Morris, this car was with the buying public and also with Isagonis. And after the success of the Morris Minor, he of course went on to design the Mini. From one iconic car to another, next on the list, the one and only Audi Quattro. Since the arrival of the Audi Quattro, no car without four-wheel drive has won a round of the World Rally Championship. The Quattro technology that the Audi used simply wiped the floor with its rear-wheel drive counterparts. The road-going version did likewise with its performance saloon competition. It was the first high-performance car with permanent four-wheel drive. The Audi Quattro undoubtedly set a, a benchmark and uh, yeah, a lot of people have been aspiring to that ever since. The Quattro was continually refined and adapted during its 11-year production. In 1991, it cost £31,000, and so it's not surprising that only 1,000 were sold. Audi wanted to discontinue the Quattro, but too many orders were still outstanding. So they compromised and built the S2, which used the same engine but was cheaper. If you look back in the history and depth of time, you'll probably find that if it wasn't for the Audi Quattro, you wouldn't have any of these, uh, you know, Evo 7s, Evo 8s, uh, Subarus, etc. I was sitting in the back of the Audi Quattro, and it was the press launch of the first Quattro. And sitting in front was Autocar's then sports editor, John Miles, who was also a Grand Prix driver and, uh, and a German engineer who was driving. And we were doing 200 clicks, you know, kilometres an hour, down the, a streaming wet autobahn. And John Miles was saying that really a two-wheel drive mid-engine car probably had better ultimate handling than a four-wheel drive car. And this German engineer was getting visibly angry and he was a, a big guy and his neck bulged over his collar at the back because I was sitting in the back, I could see this. And it was going red and he was getting angry. And John was talking about lotuses. And suddenly this German guy said, Yes, but can you do this in your Lotus? And he went, wham! And we went right over to the hard shoulder and then wham! Straight back to the Armco and wham! This is on a streaming wet autobahn at 200 kilometres an hour. And I was being thrown in the back, bouncing off the side windows. And I sort of yelled at John and said, for God's sake, shut up! <laughs>
<laughs> and, we, and we went the rest of the way in strained silence. But it did prove the point. The Quattro was unbelievably stable. Only 163 cars were exported to Britain, a disappointing start to what would become the Quattro's biggest export market. Next is an American muscle car, as famous on the screen as on the highways. At number 55 is the Pontiac Trans Am. People like Jim Rockford in the Rockford Files had these amazingly over-the-top cars with sort of moulded in spoilers, huge wide chrome wheels, uh, some of them had T-bar roofs, huge Draylon armchairs in the front, tacky as hell, but so perfectly a 70s muscle car. In 1969, with a 335 brake horsepower V8 engine, the Trans Am was born. With a small rear wing, twin narrow stripes running over the top of the car and front fenders, the car looked the business. Well, the first thing that attracted, that attracted me to Trans Ams was the fact that they were different, they were quite outrageous, and there was nothing like it in Europe apart from Euro-type boxes. I'm very surprised to find the Trans Am in the top 100 list. Um, Knight Rider, Smoking the Bandit, grow up. If you love a car because it was Kit's car, you know, really, get a girlfriend, move out your parents' home, buy a proper car, and, and, and make friends with people. That's what you need to do. It's a bit spooky to me. From 1970 to 73, the Trans Am developed into a real supercar due to its 103 mile an hour speed. The performance is quite scintillating, sort of, allied to a four-wheel motorcycle in a way because it's got such a big engine, it's 6.6 .6 litre, bags of acceleration, 0 to 60 in about 5.4 seconds if you do the right things. And this is what makes it a car that's alive and makes you feel good driving it. People who say they have an American car because they're, they're good value and they're cheap, I think you've got a question because aesthetically, they've got to like the car. You don't buy a big V8 engine car because it's cheap to run. You've got parts issues, you've got fuel issues, insurance, all that kind of stuff. You've got to buy it because you like the look of it. And yeah, American cars are very, very distinctive. Um, I have a friend that's got a Corvette and we, you know, we, we drove across Europe and, and the thing is incredibly fast. But at the end of the day, when you get out of it and you walk away, it just doesn't have that same kind of, for me anyway, that same kind of feel good factor. It, it is ultimately, you know, just a big yank Car. What will always make the Pontiac Trans Am so popular is its screen presence and its screaming chicken emblem. Forget its rivals, this car exudes aggressiveness and power. At 54, it's a German vehicle that's been at the top of its class year on year. A BMW's 5 Series has, has always been, you know, a really great car um, because it, it gives you, it's, it's a big car, you know, um, it's not as big as their 7 Series, but it's, it's a big mid-range car. It's like a, you know, a Granada Scorpio, that sort of size car. For a big car, its handling is very good, and over the years and its many improvements, it's simply got better and better. There are aspects of any car you can point to and say, yeah, I don't like that, I don't think that is so good as you know, another. Um, for instance, the new 5 Series, I don't like the styling that much. I don't like the direction that their new head of styling has taken them down. Uh, and I think the classic BMW shape was more attractive than the current crop. Unless you've actually driven the 5 Series, you could be forgiven for thinking that it's just another soft riding limo. But when you push it hard, it transforms into a sporty saloon that really rewards the driver. The BMW 5 Series is the perfect fleet car. Imagine you're running a company, you've got 30, 40, 50, however many employees, and it comes around to company car time. You put a BMW 5 Series on the list. You haven't got to give them a promotion. You haven't got to give them more pay. Suddenly, they feel worth more. The reality of it is it depreciates less than a Mondeo. Uh, it has a better image for clients and so forth. So putting your people into a 5 Series BMW makes them feel good. And if they feel better, they'll make you more money. The latest version of the 5 Series takes a few design cues from the 7, but thankfully not the controversial ones. The important changes are under the skin though, with a chassis that's lighter but stiffer, offering better performance, agility and comfort. With the introduction of this one, a lot of people thought it was a bit, a bit too edgy, a bit too different, so um, they weren't too keen. But I think the key with this one is that 
because the styling is so different. People are just starting to like it now. The new 5 is home to a simpler version of the One Knob Does All iDrive system, which is at last almost user friendly, and the optional active steering system, which alters the steering weight and ratio according to the road speed. A good idea that actually works. Well, that's nearly it for the first part of today's show, but let's see what you've voted for so far. In 60th place, the Nissan 200SX. In 59th spot, the Ferrari F40. Followed at 58 by the Ford Mondeo. At 57, we find the good old Morris Minor. In at 56, it's the Audi Quattro. At 55, the Pontiac Trans Am. And the final car in this part, the BMW 5 Series. But while we disappear for a few moments, here are some more clues to a car that you didn't vote for. A two-seater sports car inspired by Lotus, but no body panels have the manufacturer's name on at all. Happy thinking. Hello, welcome back. And here's the car that you didn't vote for, that we gave the clues for, the Vauxhall VX220. In fact, you know, there are just so many cars that you chose to leave off this list, but here's one that you definitely wanted on it. Ford aren't necessarily a company that you associate instantly with motorsport victories, but in at number 53 is the Ford Sierra. And it was from the company's exploits in the World Rally Championship that one of their greatest ever cars was developed. Although based on the heroically average Sierra, the Cosworth was a world beater and went on to shape a whole generation of cars. When the Sierra launched in 1982 as a direct replacement for the Cortina, it offered kind of mid-level family and executive transport, but also revolutionary looks. People haven't seen anything like it before. The car's appeal was obvious. In a straight line, it could out-sprint a Porsche 928 to 60, and it would even give a Ferrari Testarossa a hard time up to 100 miles an hour. I have to say, I'm really surprised this next car warrants a space of its own in the chart, because, you know, it normally shares a space with somebody else. The idea behind the Smart was to create a, a, a fun small car that people would buy and would pay a little bit extra for uh, without feeling that they were compromising on safety, looks and engineering standards. Despite being alternatively cool, the appeal of the Smart seems initially rather limited. It's only got space for two, yet slower than a bus to get to 60. So what is the secret of the Smart's success? It was marketing, beautifully marketed, uh, price, it was relatively cheap. And the other thing is, you can change it. You can change a smart car's colour very simply by going into a smart dealer and swap your body panels over. See, if you had an orange one and got fed up with it after a couple of weeks, you could change it to a blue one. The other thing is it costs seven or eight thousand pounds for a starter one and number three they've marketed that car purely as a city car. The first thing that attracted me to a smart car was it was different, it was quirky, it was just unusual, it was not the same as all the other cars on the road. The most intriguing thing about the Smart is its long-lasting appeal. Unlike other fashion accessories that become undesirable and unloved very quickly, the popularity of the Smart shows no sign of abating. We've got the, the Roadster, which is very small, very much smaller than like an MX-5, for example, very lightweight, has uh, interesting um, approaches to solving problems like the hood mechanism and things is done with a, with a bit of flair. It, it has that sort of tridian safety cell thing that's a, a smart hallmark. And it's very economical. It's a very good, fun car to drive, which you can get 50 miles to the gallon. So you're having fun on a budget, which is what Smart's all about. Well done to Smart, a company that only makes four cars, and yet three of them are in our top 100. That is a real achievement. Well, next, it's the Toyota Sora, and I can almost hear the cumulative rise of many thousands of eyebrows around the country. But the luxury coupe Sora is a hidden gem in the UK automotive world that doesn't actually officially exist. The car is now out of production, but it was originally marketed from 1991 to 2000 in America as a Lexus coupe, and in Japan as a Toyota Sora. I don't like this, this vehicle from the, the outset. Um, Basically, because it's not supposed to be in this country, it's a it's a, a Jap only vehicle. Although quite a few are imported into the into the states, and it's just a bit. Although it was, it, it's a 90s car. It looks like a very 80s car. 
every Sora has a fancy digital display, plus your car could get one of a load of options including climate-controlled air conditioning, leather upholstery, electric seats with memory, a TV reversing camera, and sometimes a TV receiver itself. It's a horrible car. I drove one recently and it was just like driving an oil tanker. You'd have to, it'd take two weeks to turn around You'd float around and move in the car and it's air suspension or whatever derivative Toyota off here. It's a car that I can't believe it's in the top 100. By far the rarest of all of the Sora models is the V8 with active suspension, incorporating four-wheel steering and traction control. But for a Japanese grey import car, isn't it a pain in the insurance and part replacement stakes? We do have some issues with servicing because the Toyota and Lexus dealers can't make up their mind whether it's A, a Toyota or B, a Lexus, but they do want to charge Lexus prices regardless. The Sora may no longer be in production, replaced officially by the new Lexus SC430. But if you would like to get your paws on one, you can get a good condition Sora for around five or six thousand. Back in 1999, Honda unveiled the all-new Roadster, the S2000, and the world hasn't been the same since. The really weird thing about a Honda S2000 is that it, it, it's got two characters. Drive it below 4,000 revs, and it is just so docile, so straightforward, so easy to drive. It feels like a Honda Accord. Start to let the revs build, get it over 6,000. Between six and 9,000 revs, it's a complete hooligan. But the Honda S2000 isn't just for mischievous burn-ups on disused airfields. It's still quite a practical proposition with a decent boot and is perfectly practical for commuting in style. Well, the frightening thing about a Honda S2000 is it's a practical car. Um, the roof doesn't leak. Um, the engine starts every time, uh, the residual values are strong, so you know, you've spent 25, 26 grand on a new one, but you come to sell it in two years' time, it's not cost a load of money, um, the dealer network is good, uh, you've got a decent boot, you've got comfy seats, I mean you've got everything. It's like a Honda Accord really, in the sense of practicality, and yet it'll keep up with a Porsche Boxster, it'll chase an Evo 8 on the road, I mean it's a seriously quick car in the right hands, and yet there's no downside to it. To sum up this car in one sentence, an automotive love affair. The latest version of the Honda S2000 now has a huge power output of 237 brake horsepower, a couple of huge superbike style exhausts, but still hasn't succumbed to the whims of people wanting a luxury roadster. Now let's be brutally honest, the name Trevor is not the most awe-inspiring in the world, but mercifully his cars are rather better. And so we have at number 49, the TVR Cerbera. Designed to be the firm's first fixed-head coupe for over a decade, the Cerbera is also the firm's sensible car in that it has rear seats. That's about as far as it goes, though, because you can carry your rear seat passengers at up to 180 miles an hour and reach 60 in 4.2 seconds. It drove fantastically. It handled beautifully. Um, I've had many a day where I've had lots of fun in a TVR Cerbera. Lots of people will give it lots of knocks for saying um, as soon as you mention the name TVR they go unreliability but to be honest with you I've only had one TVR that's ever gone wrong and I've probably driven a hundred TVRs. Whoever it appeals to its looks will always be the major draw. A product of TVR's previous design team the Cerbera isn't as cutting edge as the firm's more recent Tuscan and T350 cars but it's rounded and well proportioned and is actually quite reserved as far as TVR goes. It did what it said on the tin, it, it, it caught your eye, it looked like a fantastic GT sports car. Um, you know, all right, it felt a bit, but who cares? You can actually drive the car very normally, it's quite a safe car to drive, unless you put your foot down hard and then you start in the play mode basically. Uh, at speeds that you're not meant to do. <laughs> Viable real-world alternative or not, the Cerbera is a fantastic car in the mould of great British sports cars. And you can also get away with calling it a family car. The car in 48th spot was launched in 1972 as a diminutive car, but large enough to accommodate four passengers. I mean, can you imagine? OK, we're in the pub. Name your 100 best cars. Oh. I think the Ferraris, blah, 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 I think, oh, you can make a good argument for the Ford Focus. And then one of your mates chirps up the Honda Civic. The early Civics had quite a few style quirks, like an indicator light that looked like it had been added on after the car was built, 
and a bulging centre divider in the grille. The standard equipment of the original Honda Civic was absolutely shocking, but you've only got to look at cars of that generation, Datsun 120YA, it had a rear seat that was like an ashtray. Uh, the Honda Civic had bucket seats that were made of vinyl. Um, they were nasty things to sit in, especially on a hot summer's day. You'd come in, especially if you had shorts on, sit down, you burn your bum. Um, and they had rubbish on the dashboard. They had fake wood, and they still do it. After many years and many updates, the Civic is one of the most popular cars around, especially with the over 60s. But Honda decided to market their Civic to a wider audience, and the Type R was born. Now you're talking. Honda Civic Type R is... What was your mum's car, really, isn't it? A Honda Civic is the car that your mum would go to the shops in. But you stick a chuffing, great big engine under the bonnet that screams its little lungs out, stick some low-profile tyres, fat alloy wheels, dynamic steering, and a gear change that is so perfectly positioned that you have got a recipe for success. The first thing that attracts people to the Type R is the look of the car, obviously. When they then find out about the performance, it just keeps them more interested. In terms of price, the Honda is available at between 9 and 18,000, which isn't too bad, is it? So you see, the Civic makes it into the list, if only because it's hung around so long in what is a highly competitive industry. Right, next up, one of the original hot hatches, the Peugeot 205. It was introduced to the UK in October 1983 as a replacement for the old 104. It was an instant success, and was praised for its modern styling, comfort, handling, and practicality. What a car, I mean, dynamically it was awesome. The right layout, obviously, front wheel drive, front engine. The Peugeot 205 GTI arrived on the scene in early 1984 with 105 brake horsepower from its 1.6 litre injected engine, and it could hit 60 in around nine seconds. I mean, when, it, when the 205 was originally launched in 83, it was obvious then that it could handle more power and it only took a year, I think 84, when the 1.6 GTI was launched, just over 100 horsepower. Um, Mind-blowing car. The little Peugeot 205 took the crown away from the Golf to become the king of the GTIs. You still see it mentioned in group car tests of the newest hot hatches, but unfortunately, Peugeot have never recreated the gem of a car that was the 205 GTI. I don't think the 205's aged at all over the years. I think for a car that's 20 years old, it looks, it looks all right. We think that so many people have voted for the 205 as no model since has managed to create quite the same driving experience. Well, next, we find ourselves looking at one of those rare beasts in the motor industry, a car that combines looks and practicality. When the project first started in 1994, Chrysler was looking for an image-building car that would complement their huge trucks and SUVs. I think whatever you are, you look at it, it's a fantastic looking car and it's certainly more attractive than the majority of bigger cars are on the road today. While the PT Cruiser was in development, small MPVs like the Renault Megane Scenic or the Fiat Multipla were hot sellers in Europe, taking over where full-sized MPVs would have been bought before. The PT Cruiser attracted a great deal of attention on tour, and Chrysler quickly decided to build the cars at their Graz factory in Austria instead of in the USA. I think you have to look at the way trends are changing. People in Europe are really getting excited by retro styling at the moment. So you've got the new Mini, which is a massive success story, the new Beetle, and then the PT Cruiser, which goes back to the hot rod styling. I think people are really looking for more kind of interest in retro styling in a car these days. The key to the success of the PT Cruiser is in the detail. Late in the Cruiser's development, the team realised the old neon steering wheel was boring and they asked engineers to come up with a new design. The team quickly came up with a steering wheel that's as individual as the car itself. Likewise, a number of gear stick designs were considered before the current retro cue ball was selected. Well, I like anything that's American retro, so for me it's, it's just a, a piece of classic American motoring. The PT Cruiser hasn't been a huge sales success in the UK, but the people who have them generally love them. Well, before we leave you again for a quick cuppa or maybe something a little bit stronger, Here's a reminder of what you voted for in this particular section. In at 53, it's the Ford Sierra. Squeezing in at 52, the Smart for two. At number 51, it's the Toyota Sora. Exactly halfway through your 100, it's the Honda S2000. In 49th spot, the TVR Cerbera. At 48, it's the Honda Civic. In at number 47, the Peugeot 205. And the last car for the moment is the Chrysler PT Cruiser. 
Well, it's break time again, so in the intervening few moments, think about this car, again, that you didn't vote for. Its emblem is a bull, and when you open the doors on this particular model, it actually looks like a bull. So what are we talking about? Hello again, and the answer to that little tease before the break, the very bullish car, is the Lamborghini Miura. Well into the top half of the chart now, so let's see what's coming up next. Continuing a lengthy bloodline, the 300ZX was the most potent version yet. Available with a 3-litre, normally aspirated 222 bhp V6 or a twin-turbo quad-cam 24-valve 300 bhp version, the 300ZX was the Jap supercar of the early 90s. Very, very evocative looking uh, Ferrari-esque shape lines. Um, and it certainly opened up what was the Europeans' eyes to what um, the Japanese designers could do. And it really was the first affordable supercar to come out of the Far East. With such impressive statistics and a shape like that, the 300ZX had to deliver, and it did. The only thing it managed to do quicker than the 0-60 Sprint was win the hearts of car enthusiasts the world over. Whereas before, Japanese cars had been able to keep up with their Italian friends in terms of performance, their image had always struggled. Now, the Nissan 300ZX looked as good as anything the Scuderia could offer. Really before the 300 or the Z range of cars, uh, we had nothing like it. Um, the shape, the design, uh, the look of the car was just pure Italian. It was, it was exactly what was right for that time. Uh, they got the marketing right, they got the looks right, they got the, uh, the colours right, they were all nicely uh, finished off inside and outside. They had vented flues on the, uh, on the um, dashboard, you looked at the speedo for a binnacle, you had uh, beautiful little aluminium push buttons on the, on the dashboard. It was just right for the time and they did a cracking job. Today, like all Japanese supercars, the 300ZX is a favourite of the modding crowd and can be seen in all sorts of lurid colours with bits of MDF nailed to the bodywork in a feeble attempt to improve its looks. So the Nissan 300ZX is in 45th place and this next car is one ahead. Britain's most successful sports car manufacturer is based in Blackpool. Named after the company creator Trevor Wilkinson, it's produced performance cars able to steal Ferrari's thunder, but also at a fraction of the cost. TVR fans will know the Tamora from the Griffith, but what's been the most successful TVR to date may surprise you. It's the latter's replacement, the Tuscan. When it was first shown, it was incredibly avant-garde. I don't know what the French is for that. Um, it was uh, incredible. You looked at it and thought, that's a stunning car. And you thought, but you know, Trevor in Blackpool isn't going to be able to make that at a cost, you know. And of course it turned out to be true, you know, they brought it to the road. And it was a uh, sensational design, you know. You know, it had Rover V8 engines in and all the rest of it and wasn't uh, quite uh, as, as revolutionary under the skin as, uh, as it suggested, but it was a sensational car. I think the thing that appeals to me about the TVR, particularly the Tuscan, is the shape. It's so sexy, it turns heads when you, you drive down the street. With it only taking 4.2 seconds to do 0 to 60 and producing 450 brake horsepower from its V8 engine, this car has the power of the Ferrari F40 and weighs the same as the Ford Fiesta. Now there's a thought. I've never been brave enough to drive a TVR anywhere near their capability because I think you've got to have balls the size of King Kong. They've got no ABS, they've got no driver aids. They're, they're, I'm, I'm convinced I would die in one. They're made of fiberglass. All right, they've got presumably you know, a great chassis under there, but I, I would never presume to be that brave to drive them anywhere near their limits. There's not an angle on there and it's just so sensual the way the curves fit together. Well, now we come to one of the last hairy chested sports cars on the market. But for the money, for the performance, and also for being British, it just had to be in your list somewhere. In at number 43 is the Lotus Elise. 
Billed as the star of the Frankfurt Motor Show in 1995 when it was unveiled, it was a super light car weighing in at just 1,488 pounds with an advanced chassis made of aluminium and it made its mark in history as the first Lotus created on computer. No car company can survive by making just one car, which is where Lotus found themselves, making just the Esprit. Um, they had to build another car. The Elan had finished. The Elise, really, if it had failed, would have probably been the death knell for Lotus. The Elise S1 was finally released in 1996, promising owners breathtaking performance, 0 to 60 in 5.9 seconds, stunning looks, and it was priced at less than £20,000. So what more could you ask for? The car to drive is uh, a joy. Um, it, it is a go-kart. Um, you are at one with the road. You, you sit in it as opposed to on it. Um, you feel every bump in the road. Um, it's really, really good fun. The Elise proved to be a great success thanks to its aluminium chassis and its conformation to Lotus car founder Colin Chapman's principle, enhance performance through lightness. There's a huge amount of snob value in what engine a car has and a lot of people knock the Elise because it's got a Rover engine there. But the key to the Elise is not about the engine, it's all about weight. The Elise is 350 kilos lighter than MGTF. It's 500 kilos lighter than Porsche 911. It doesn't need a stonking great engine. And actually that K-series engine from the Rover is a cracking engine. Free revving, reliable, cheap, light. It was the perfect engine for the Elise. Well, it may not be the purest form of Elise, but for drivers wanting a slice of 21st century comfort in a package that enhances rather than weakens the sporting integrity of the basic car, it could quite possibly be the best. In the later 111R, they put the Celica engine in the 190 brake horsepower VVT engine. Fact of the matter is, on paper anyway, it's like 0.2 a second quicker to 60. There's no difference. It's just snob value. You can say to your mate, oh, I've got a Toyota engine, I haven't got a Rover engine. But the fact of the matter is, I'd be quite happy with the K-Series Rover engine lease. It's a great car. Well, you're being very patriotic at this stage of the chart, from one British car to another. Forget your trendy, modern off-roaders, your BMW X5s, Volvo XC90s. You're not so fashionable, but oh so serious off-roader, the Land Rover Defender is hard to beat. Tough as old boots, it's, it's perhaps as rough as old boots, and it's as refined as, as a very unrefined pair of old boots. The Defender replaced the long-serving Series 3 back in 1983. Seven years later, it was renamed the Defender 90 and 110 to distinguish it from the company name. It has been around for years, and. It's fantastic to see a vehicle now that still looks very similar to the, to the original model. These vehicles were the most radical change that Land Rover had ever made to its range of models. They were distinguished visually by a one-piece windscreen, a radiator grille that was flush with the front of the wing panels, and wheel arch extensions. Each vehicle that I've driven has been a completely different experience. Um, depending on the wheels you've got, depending on the suspension, depending on the size of your steering wheel, depending on the seats that you've got inside it. I've never driven two Land Rovers the same. With 2.5 and 3.5 litre petrol and diesel versions available, you can buy a Defender for between 18 and 28,000 pounds. Why Land Rover? <laughs> Look what it does. It's fantastic. It's fun. The family enjoy it. It's powerful. It's, it's exciting. It's challenging and I like breaking them so we can fix them again. <laughs> the Defender is one of the most popular off-roaders, be it parked in a country estate or on a hillside. This car genuinely remains true to what it is. A car that has truly shaped the world and has boldly gone where few others have been able to. Now, one more to go in this particular section. Before that, though, let's recap on the rest. In 45th place, we have the Nissan 300ZX. At 44, you voted for the TVR Tuscan. Screaming in at 43, the Lotus Elise. Driving across your screen at 42, the Land Rover Defender. And on now to our last car at 41, the Aston Martin Vanquish. When Ford took over Aston Martin in 1987, their ambition was to elevate the then small but exclusive car firm to the level of a Ferrari. 
I mean, what Ford did is they took over Aston Martin, they put money into research, they put money into design, and they really brought it back to what it should have been. I mean, now you've got the DB9, you've got the Vanquish, they're both fantastic, iconic cars in the Aston Martin style. The DB7 was the car that saved Aston Martin, a car for the rich rather than the super rich, and a car Aston had to build rather than wanted to build. Because the car that Aston Martin wanted to build, they'd have to wait for for at least 10 years. The DB7 was a huge success, and the company was safely in profit when the Project Vantage concept car was unveiled at the Detroit Motor Show in 1998. When Ford took over Aston Martin, they really needed to show the world that the company could be what it should be, and Project Vantage did that. It was a 550 brake horsepower show car, I and mean, basically they built it to wow the world, and wow the world it did. Due to the ecstatic reception, Aston Martin had no choice but to give Project Vantage the production green light. Three years later, in March 2001, under the glamorous lights of the Geneva Motor Show, Aston Martin unveiled the Vanquish. It's steeped in heritage. Um, it's unique to look at. Its performance is second to none. Um, and everybody, at some point in life, I would imagine, would want to own and drive an Aston Martin motor car. Looking nearly identical to the Project Vantage, the Vanquish is in fact 5.9 inches narrower than the concept car. Under that long, aggressive nose sits a 6-litre V12 tuned to 460 brake horsepower, enough for the Vanquish to reach 60 miles an hour in 4.8 seconds and a top speed of 196 miles an hour. Now, cynics may say that the Vanquish's engine began as two Mondeo V6s welded together, but they soon shut up when they hear the exhaust note. I think if I was spending thousands and thousands of pounds on an Aston Martin and I found a switch that looked like something from a Ford, I may be a little bit put out. <laughs> the car to drive is an experience that once you've done it, you will just definitely never, never forget the car. The first time that I ever sort of dro drove the vehicle, I was sort of in shock for about 10 minutes after I, I came out of the car. It's just an experience that once in a lifetime, that um, even for myself at the time, but I think if anybody drives the car, they you know, just want to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. The Vanquish was also a massive leap in the technology stakes for Aston Martin. The body panels aren't welded together, but glued. The advantages are that the car is not only lighter, but also stiffer. And you don't change gear with a traditional gear stick. Vanquish drivers change gear with paddle shifts, just like a Formula One car. I mean, the whole concept between a GT car is you can jump in it, you can drive to the south of France, stop just for petrol and then have a bottle of wine when you get there and fe feel great. And Aston Martin do that so well because all their cars are bespoke, you know, they've put the money into the tuning, they've put the money into the handling. And, you know, at the end of the day, Aston Martin aren't building supercharged performance cars in the same sort of vein as Ferrari. You know, they're building cars that are just fantastic and great to drive as well as having the performance to match it. So the Vanquish may not be the leanest of sporting cars, but then few Astons have been. It's good for us all that Aston Martin is prosperous once again and that they still make cars like the Vanquish and it's so high in your chart of the 100 most popular cars. So just 40 cars to go, and never mind you at home, I bet there's a few manufacturers watching this wondering how far up or indeed down the list their pride and joy is going to be. We may find out next time. See you then. Bye-bye.